Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new day, new week. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, yes, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Maybe Paul, uh, can you please lead us in prayer? Okay, uh, Zeli? Oh, okay, Paul's available. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for today that you brought us together. As we are going to learn from your word, let it inspire us, let it dwell in us, let it become powerful in us and do your missionary work. We pray and declare all this in Jesus Christ's name, Son of the living God, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Paul. All right. So uh, before we go ahead, let me just do a quick review of what we did last week. Last week, we looked at chapter 16, Isaiah chapter 53, and we saw how important, uh, you know, Isaiah prophesies such wonderful things about the cross. Uh, Isaiah 53, if you read it in its entirety, it's got so many prophecies. Now, if you, even if you read the whole portion of Isaiah, the whole book of Isaiah, there's so many wonderful prophecies. And we looked at the authenticity of Isaiah right now. It's also important that, uh, you know, to look at authenticity uh, because many people may say many things, but what's the authenticity? What is the proof uh, that what we're talking about is true? And so we looked at how, you know, uh, even though the Dead Sea Scrolls 1,300 years ago, what was found uh, and, and what was written early in, uh, early in uh, around 400 BC, we see that both of them match. And a lot of portions of Isaiah was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it is safe to say that whatever we are reading now from the book of Isaiah is word to word perfect. Of course, there are different translations, but the essence and the, uh, the, the, the prophecies are all perfect. right? And so we looked at three views on studying Isaiah 53. Right? Three views of studying Isaiah 53. The first view was see what Christ accomplished on the cross uh, for us, right? As foretold by Isaiah. Remember, we looked at how, um, you know, uh, behold my servant, Ibod Adonai, uh, his visage will be marred. There will be nothing, uh, you know, beautiful in him. Uh, they will, you know, they will, his blood shall sprinkle the nations. Uh, the arm of the Lord has been revealed, which means what? Uh, God has revealed it to his people, but not everyone have understood it. Then we also looked at how he will grow up as a tender shoot uh, out of the ground, uh, which means the Lord will protect God, protected over, the, over Jesus even as he was growing up. He was a man of sorrows and grief. Uh, uh, he bore our griefs. He bore our, uh, you know, he carried our sorrows. Um, and for our peace, he died on the cross. So there was so many different things that the Lord Jesus did and accomplished for us on the cross. Uh, then the second view uh, was as believers, we, we see what has been made available to us through the cross. Right? Remember that verse in Isaiah 53? For by his chastisement, we find peace. There is hope. There is deliverance. Remember the verse where it says that by his stripes, we are healed. So we receive healing. We receive deliverance. We receive hope. We receive joy, comfort, forgiveness of sins, and so many uh, wonderful promises. And the third view we looked at was as believers, uh, how do we see or, or where is the imitation of the cross for us to apply in our daily lives, right? Uh, now, first one was, you know, what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Second view was as believers, what do we receive uh, because of the cross? And third one is, how can I apply the work of the cross in my daily life? And so we looked at, you know, how the New Testament scripture calls us and says, you are no longer slaves to sin. You've been crucified with Christ. You have been taken from uh, you know, sickness and bondage and 
the, from the work of the enemy to the power of God, to the presence of God, to uh, from the place of darkness to eternal light. And there's this whole translation. And so when we live out our daily life, we live out not as children of Adam, but children of the Most High God, the last Adam uh, who overcame every obstacle who overcame death for us. So when we are living our life, we live out of that identity. We are victorious. We are conquerors in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, so it's so wonderful to you know, read these scriptures and reiterate it in our lives. Now, uh, remember, we always emphasize that we must not only just be you know, heroes of the word, but we must be doers of the word. So what we are studying, what we are learning, uh, it's very important that we walk on those promises. For example, you know, there's all of a sudden the enemy will bring fear into our hearts, right? a feeling of fear or you feel like you're sinking down. What is it that we can do? Remember the cross. Remember what Isaiah said. And remember what we as believers receive through the cross. Right? And then we apply it in our lives and say, okay, I know this fear is real. I know that the enemy is putting this fear in my mind. Yet, I will declare what God has called me to be. And he has said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. So, when we declare these verses in our daily lives, what we're doing is we're living our identity out of the cross. Right? Apostle Paul, the great man, also says, uh, it's no longer I who live. In the body I'm living, but my spirit, my will is all yielded to Christ. My sin, my fleshly desires have been crucified with Christ. Right? And so we can attain that, you know, we can work towards that. Uh, remember, God is changing us. From glory to glory, strength to strength, right? So we completed this Isaiah 53. Now we're going to go to the next portion, 17th chapter. Uh, we're on page 84. We're going to talk about how Jesus foretells the cross. Now, we did study about this. We did, uh, you know, establish the fact that Jesus knew the reason why he came, right? It was not like, Jesus was scared of the cross or he wanted to escape from the cross. No, uh, you know, he came into this world and he knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew that there will come a time that the sins of the world will be put upon him and he will die on the cross. He knew it, right? So it is not plan B as we had already discussed. So let's look at a few verses. Uh, we're going to read a couple of verses. I just want to encourage some of us to just keep your Bibles open and quickly read uh, the verses that we just, we just look at, uh, not all the verses, but let's look at a couple of them. Let's read Luke chapter 2, 34 and 35. Luke 2, 34 and 35, yes. And then somebody else can please... Uh, Go to John chapter 1, verse 29. So we can read those two. So the first one is Luke 2, 34 and 35. Yes, please go ahead. Anyone? Luke chapter 2, verses 34. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Amen. Thank you, Sid. Uh, let's read John one twenty nine as well. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Anita. So we see here that the first one, Luke 2, 34, a sword shall pierce your own heart, talking about Jesus' mother, and he will reveal the hearts of the people, will despise him, 
uh, and we talked about what the cross was. It was not a beautiful sight. It was not something that was oh, so wonderful. You know, uh, we, we sing that song, right? Uh, wonderful cross, beautiful cross. Uh, that's because we know the revelation. We have received, uh, you know, the power of the cross into our lives. We understand what the cross is. But in physicality, if we had, we had seen it, there was nothing beautiful in that, right? Uh, and so here the writer uh, of Luke says, uh, Luke is writing and he's saying that uh, he, this, because of the cross, he will reveal the hearts of people. So again, he's foretelling the cross. Let's read uh, probably John chapter 15 and verse 13. John 15 and verse 13. Then John 15, can... 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Yes, thank you, Zeli. No love is greater than this than anyone who's willing to lay down their life for his friends. The Lord Jesus is talking to his disciples, saying, there's no greater love than this, that a man is willing to lay down his life for his friend. So Jesus knew it. Uh, he knew that he has to lay down his life for the people of the world, right? Uh, John 17 and verse 1. And maybe somebody else can move to Matthew chapter 16, 13 to 26. Let's read John 17 and verse 1. John 17 and verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked towards the heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Amen. Thank you, Sid. The time has come. Glorify your son, so that the son may glorify you. Now, what is he talking about, glorify your son? Jesus is talking about the crucifixion, and through his death, he is going to glorify the father through the death, through this crucifixion. And there will come a time he will go back and be with his father and he will be this he will attain that same glory that he was that he had before the foundations of the world so jesus knew that these are things that are going to happen right it was not like he was surprised he was not he knew that you know jesus in his mind didn't think okay i, I hope i can live for 50 years or i hope i can live for 60 years no he knew it. He knew that time has come. Now glorify me just as, you know, so that I can glorify you, the Father. Right? Jesus knew it. Let's read this. It's a bigger portion. Matthew chapter 16, 13 to 26. Matthew 16, 13 to 26. Matthew 16, 13 to 26. Yes, anyone, please. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 26. When Jesus came to the region of Kassara, Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hates will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was Christ. 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, 
and that he must be killed on the third day he will be raised to life peter took him aside and began to rebuke him never lord he said this shall never happen to you jesus turned and said to peter get behind me satan you are stumbling block to me you do not have in mind the things of god but the things of men then jesus said to his disciples if anyone would come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me forever wants to save his life will lose it but whosoever loses his life for me will find it what good will be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeit the soul or what a man give in exchange of his soul hey man thank you thank you said uh, now just picture this it's really interesting to read this portion the disciples have seen all the wonderful miracles jesus has done right they've seen him uh, you know uh, take the five loaves of bread and two fish served it to thousands they've seen him raise up lazarus they've seen him heal the leper and the lame the blind they've seen all these wonderful miracles and now towards the end of jesus's ministry this is asking peter peter who do you say i am you know many people say a lot of things about me uh, they say i'm a healer they say i'm elijah some say i'm uh, i'm just a carpenter's son or you know, he's a prophet and uh, you know some say that the angel of god has sent me so peter what do you say who do you say i am so peter says you are the son of the living god right and jesus is pleased and he said this is right and upon that revelation of jesus being the son of god i will build my church right now just a couple of verses later it says that jesus went about teaching the disciples and telling them every time i'm not going to be with you long there will come a time i'll have to go to jerusalem people will hand me over to the authorities and i will be killed immediately jesus peter says no lord that that should not be so jesus rebukes peter and says you don't have the things of god but the things of man so you see it was such a perfect example of human beings right people like us where you know peter is so pleased he knows who jesus is he knows and he he is the one who said you know on this you are this christ the son of the living god and he had this great revelation but a couple of verses later he says no lord we don't want you to die on the cross what does this teach us you know the lord jesus was prepared what it teaches us is sometimes we we may have a great revelation of who god is but for that revelation to become real in our life we need the work of the holy spirit we need to walk in wisdom right so sometimes there are people who have great revelations of god you know revelations of the word of god but they don't walk in wisdom right the revelation is true but the outcome of the revelation walking of in wisdom is faltered peter i'm sure it was he was just genuine right but there was a, a sense of you know he wanted to protect jesus but he didn't see the things of god you know even in our lives sometimes we have these great revelations god has spoken to us previously before god has done wonderful miracles in our lives and we can testify of it but suddenly there comes a season when we feel that all doors are blocked everything is closed feel that we are just trapped in a room and there's nowhere to go uh, and then we may forget all about the revelation and put our focus on what the enemy is doing right what does jesus tell peter get away from me satan right that was strong words i wonder how peter would have felt he said you why are you calling me satan lord i'm trying to protect you yes you're trying to protect me but that's the enemy who's trying to put that thought in your mind so that i may not go to the cross and if i don't go to the cross the purpose of me coming into this world is lost so very important just as how jesus knew what was ahead of him 
as believers, we must know what is ahead of us in the sense that we know, okay, one day we will be with the Lord. Uh, you know, one day we will be in his presence. Yet there are these days, these are, there are these seasons in our lives that God takes us through. But we live with eternity values, right? Uh, like for example, you know, you know, we are in the workplace, right? We are working, we are in the corporate sector. It's very difficult to live a holy life, live with honesty, integrity. But God is calling us to walk in holiness. God is calling us to walk in integrity. So we need to put our focus, put our mind on Christ, knowing that, Lord, you are there with us. You are there with me. You will empower me to walk a life of holiness. And then when we align ourselves to that, we, we, you know, we obey God. We, we are pleased in God's eyes. Right? Peter wanted to do something good in his heart. And, uh, I, was, I always wonder, what would I do if Jesus said this? Probably I would have said, Lord, no. Let's, let's, let's probably send you to Samaria. They all like you there. Or we'll send you to Judea. There the people are good. They like you. Jerusalem, you don't be here for some time. And Jesus did that previously in his ministry. Right? He went away from Jerusalem. He said, uh, you know, a prophet is uh, not recognized in his own hometown. And he goes away because his ministry, nobody was accepting him. So he went to different places. So maybe we would have said the same thing. Yet God says, the Lord Jesus says, no, that's not the purpose. It's not that I have to run away from challenges. I have to walk through those challenges. Right? Uh, and we see what God accomplished through the cross. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26, the Lord Jesus is there. He knew his time is very close. What does he do? He prays. And there's this whole sense of of you know the weight of the sins of the world coming upon him right remember that jesus did not know sin which means he did not sin he was tempted in all ways but he did not sin now, how can the sins of the entire world something that he has not tasted be put upon him in full measure and so that is why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Lord, if this is, let not my will, if it's possible, let this cup pass by. But if it's, it's let not my will, but let your will be done. Right? So we see that in many places, the Lord Jesus foretells of the cross. He was pleased with it. He was looking forward to it. And the scriptures teaches us that you know, he says, I will make all things new through the cross. Right? So let's go to the next portion, which is the wisdom of the cross. Now, I know that we've all, you know, uh, learned about this and uh, we probably heard a lot of sermons as well. But it's good to refresh our hearts, refresh our spirits. This is the eternal truth. The cross is the basis of our foundation of our life. Right. So let's look at. The wisdom of the cross. Firstly, let's look at the title, the wisdom of the cross. You know, the whole aspect of God becoming man, coming into this world, living a perfect life, dying on the cross for each one of them, is not a natural wisdom. It is not something that people who out of their natural heart will believe. What Jesus, what God did was wisdom. He expressed wisdom through this entire uh, ordeal of the cross of Jesus Christ. There was substitution involved. God died for man. Let's look at a few verses. Hebrews 2 9 says, but we, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of god might taste death for everyone he by the grace of god may taste death for everyone how did death come into this world we know sin and death came through satan when adam 
disobeyed God. We, we, the fall of man caused sin and sin causes death. Now God, by the grace of God, that he might taste death for everyone. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, which is the anointed one, the son of the living God, died for us. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Right? The Greek word here used here is the word hooper, H-U-P-E-R, hooper. Now, now, what is this word, the Greek word hooper? It can be translated into four different ways, right? First one, instead of, Christ died, hooper, instead of me. Second one, in place of, when Christ died, he took my place. You know, I was supposed to be on the cross, but Jesus took my place. Three, on behalf of, the word on behalf of refers to, hey, uh, you know, I'm sure we've done this, right? Uh, probably in school or college, uh, you know, somebody is unwell, maybe your, your friend is unwell, they come to college and the teacher says, uh, I expected this person to do the, uh, you know, to do a presentation in the class. Maybe your friend comes and says, can I do it on behalf of her or him? So what is that? This other person, the friend is at home, maybe unwell. But the, the other friend comes and says, I will do it on behalf of my friend. I'm going to represent her. So what God did and what the Lord Jesus did is he represented us before the Father. Fourth one, he was as a substitute. Right? Substitution means he became what we are. He took our place. Right. It's so wonderful to just think about these four aspects. Instead of me, it was Jesus. In place of me, it was Jesus. On behalf of me, it was Jesus. And as a substitute for me, it was Jesus. The, the, the wrath of God and the anger, the, the, the wrath against sin and, and Satan, all of that wrath was supposed to fall on me. What did Jesus do? Through the Lord's death, Hooper, through that, he came and took my place. Right? Only a perfect man could be a substitute. Right? Uh, even if there was one sin, in Jesus, the substitution would have not been valid. Even one sin. Imagine if Jesus, you know, when he was uh, in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, the enemy comes and says, why don't you take this stone and turn it into bread and eat it because you're hungry? Imagine if Jesus said, okay, anyways, I'm in the desert. There's nobody here. No no, none of the disciples are there. No people are there who can watch me. So I can just turn it into bread and eat it. Because anyway, it's, it's, uh, this whole world is my creation. I can do it. Could he have done it? Yes. But he didn't. Why? Because he knew that if he did it, he would fall into temptation. He would sin. And the entire purpose for what he had come for will be nullified. There was no sin in him. A perfect man could only substitute for a sinful man. A man who was already a sinner could not become a substitute for other men. Remember in the old covenant, 
the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. Yes, he would go as a substitute. But what he had to do, he had to first cleanse himself. He had to pray. He had to uh, make an offering for himself and say, God, I'm coming. I am also a sinner, but I'm coming on behalf of my people, behalf of my nation. Please forgive their sins. And he had to make atonement for himself first, then do it for the nation. Secondly, one man's obedience, the last Adam, through him, everyone was made perfect. Now look at this, this whole picture, right? Adam sinned. After Adam, Cain, then the generations that came, sin was automatically imputed upon us, right? Now, who taught Cain to murder Abel? Who, who taught him to get angry with, uh, you know, uh, Abel? Who taught him to get jealous? That's so much anger that he went and killed his own brother. Who taught him that? Right? Before that, Adam and Eve didn't know what it is. Didn't know sin. They, they, they were sitting probably the, with the wild animals around. Nothing. They didn't know sin. But now, who taught Cain to kill Abel? It was the sin because of Adam, because of the fall, the sin that is there in us, caused Cain to kill Abel. And then even when we look now, people around us and even our lives, why, do, why is there so much sin? Why is there sickness? Why is there death? Because sin, because of Adam, because what he did was he disobeyed God and it was imputed upon all of us. When we are born, we are born in sin. You don't teach a two-year-old child or a three-year-old child how to lie. They know it. Right? They know it. Whether they are the, you know, they may be the pastor's children or prophet's children or the greatest man uh, in the world to have the holiest man in the world. Their children would have automatically learned how to lie, how to cheat. How? Because it is sin that is already in us. It's in our nature. But what did Jesus do? When he died on the cross, although it appeared as, it, as if it was man dying, it was God dying for humanity. And so when we believe in this cross, our identity immediately changes from Adam's as our father to the Lord Jesus as our savior. Immediately it just changes. Right? But what is the wisdom of the cross? We must believe in it. Right? So if we were living in sin, we're living a, you know, a life of continual sin, then suddenly the Lord Jesus reveals himself and we accept the Lord Jesus, we ask for forgiveness, we change our lives and we believe in the cross, what happens? Our identity is changed. Physically, we look the same. Right? Uh, we, want, we will not get a halo, we will not get wings. Uh, physically, we look the same. We will have our same family, same friends. We are not glorified just because we receive Jesus. Uh, as our personal savior. Everything is the same, but our identity changes. We are no longer of the enemy. We don't belong to Adam, but we belong to the last Adam. Here, Adam fell. Here, the last Adam, he conquered. So we are translated from this generation to the generation of our last Adam. Now, we can say, hey, that Adam, the first Adam, when the serpent came, he disobeyed, he ate, and sin and death came into this world. But the last Adam, the same serpent came, the same temptations came, but he overcame. And when I believe in him, my identity changes. So now I'm no longer in sin. I'm no longer a sinner. Right? Uh, there is sin in the world, but I'm no longer a sinner because my identity has changed. Right? The real work is a spiritual work. Uh, for perfect holiness to come in contact with sin is far worse 
than the humil uh, physical humiliation and torture that Jesus endured, endured, right? Perfect holiness. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was there with the Father in the presence of the Father. He was God, right? He, perfect holiness. More than the physical and your, uh, you know, uh, challenges that Jesus went through, it was more of an emotional stress. You know, uh, science proves that when we go through intense stress, you know, the, the, you, you, you know, there's, it affects on your body, right? It affects on your skin. It, it shows in your skin, right? Uh, there are people that are sometimes, you know, people who have, you know, scales on their skin or psoriasis and burning sensation and all of these things. It's intense stress. It shows it, it, it released out on the skin. It's, it's, it's scientifically proof. Now, stress that is even more intense than that will cause blood to come out of your nose and ears and uh, because it's it, your blood vessels gets compressed and it just begins to burst. The Bible says that Jesus had drops of sweat of like blood falling down. It was not because, oh, the nails are going to be five inch long, one nail here, one nail here. They're going to beat me. They're going to put a crown. How will I manage? There will not be any water. There will not be food. How will I be in the dungeon? I'm not used to this. It was not about the physical. It was more of an emotional. God, Father, I have not tasted sin. I don't know what sin is. But now the sin of the world is going to come upon me. And there's going to be this separation between you and me, which has never happened before. Right? When Jesus was there before the foundation, he was there with the, with the Father. There was no separation. Even when he was born, there was no separation. Right? All through Jesus' ministry, there was no separation. He always called him Father. I will do my Father's will. The Father and I are one. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Remember those verses? So they were one. Now all of a sudden, because of the cross, Jesus is going to taste death, and he's going to taste what it feels like to be separated from the Father. That was something too much for him to handle. That is why it is only on the cross but the Lord Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the sins of the world was upon him. He was no longer, God the Father was no longer a father to him at that moment. There was a separation. God had to turn his face, even when, as Jesus was on the cross. He had to turn his face away where the righteous judgment of God was imputed on Jesus. Right? If you see all through Jesus' ministry, never has Jesus said, my God. He's always said, my Father. It was only on the cross because of sin, that separation. He says, my God, why have you forsaken me? That pain of being away from you, the pain of tasting sin, which I've never tasted, it's too much to handle. Yet, in the end, he says, into your hands, Father, into your hands, I command my spirit. And it's so wonderful to see the substitution. He died so that we can live. He was stoned away from God so that we can be brought to God. He became sin so that we may be made righteous. He became poor so that we may be rich. When we say poor and rich, we're not talking about um, uh, you know, physical, uh, material poor. We're talking about spiritually. He became poor for a moment because the sin of the world was upon him. But through that, we, be, we are rich. He took our place here on earth to give us a place in heaven. What a wonderful promise. He became what we were so that we could share in who he is. Amen. That's so wonderful. Imagine this. 
Uh, I'm not going. I'm not trying to put fear into us, right? But imagine this, right? Uh, either way, you know, when when a believer passes away, what does Paul say? To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Now imagine this, right? If the cross was not there, if Jesus did not die on the cross, what would have happened? We're going to live righteous lives, but we cannot enter his presence just like that. There would have been a place, and we'll talk about paradise and uh, Abraham's bosom, but there would have been a place where we would have just been there. Our souls would have been resting. Or if we were living in sin, there was a place of torment. But here, as believers, just by believing in the cross, you and I get to be in the presence of Jesus when we die. Right? Or even if the rapture happens, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, he says, in the twinkling of an eye, we will get a glorified body and we will see him face to face. Can you picture that? We will see the Lord Jesus face to face. We will. The Bible says that we will see him as he is. In his glorified state. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful exchange. We don't have to, you know, sit in one place and, you know, because there's no torment, but just sitting there. No, no, God is saying, I'm giving you something better than that. You will be with me in heaven. I will be your king and I will be with you. Your, my presence will surround you. This is the greatest comfort that we have as believers. Right? We can say, God, that is not the end. It's not the end. It's just that our bodies are going to fade away. Here, we are going to be with the Lord forever. Our glorified bodies. All this is possible because of the cross. You know, we study end times and revelations and what's going to happen in heaven and earth and all of these things. All of this is possible because of the cross. The son of the, he became what we are so we could share in who he is. Imagine the father seated on the throne, right? And he says, he looks at us and he says, I don't see any sin in you. Why? Because I'm seeing you through the eyes of my son, Jesus. Right? And the price is paid. The son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. Now we can say, I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. The the word atonement means that Jesus met the demands of God's justice for sin and towards the sinner. Christ became an atonement for us in order to turn aside God's anger towards sin and complete the requirement of God's judgment towards sin. The atonement, which means he, he, Jesus met the demands Remember the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament? What do they do in the Day of Atonement? They would bring the lamb, they would cut the lamb, take the offering, uh, uh, you know, take the blood, they will pray, they will go give it to the high priest. The high priest will go into the Holy of Holies, smear the blood, and he would come out once a year, Day of Atonement. That means God has turned away his wrath. He's put the wrath of, of uh, you know, on that, sacrifice on that lamp but here Christ became the atonement the anger of God the wrath of God was put on Jesus Christ and God's judgment complete judgment was you know just lashed out on Jesus fully full of God's anger and wrath on Jesus but what did God do after that? 
he said, you know, the Bible says that God, the Spirit of God, raised him up on the third day. So he says here, it's so wonderful when you picture it. God put all his wrath, all his anger on Jesus, all the sins of the world upon him. He died this most horrendous, painful death. And then the father decides, I will raise him up. On the third day, Jesus rises again. Now, this is not, you know, uh, in the spirit. This is in the physical body. Jesus, who was dead with scars and wounds and pierced hands, his body had resurrected. They can't find the body of Jesus. Right? They can't find anything. Jesus walked out of that tomb. He goes to his disciples. Thomas is unbelieving for a moment there. What does he tell Thomas? Thomas, come here. Put your finger into my side. Put your finger into my hands and see. Because flesh and blood will not, uh, you know, if I, I am in flesh and blood. So he overcame that. He overcame death. His substitutionary death removed the barrier between man and God and offered unlimited atonement to all of us. The last Adam broke down the walls that the first Adam constructed. Such a good saying. The last Adam, the first Adam, he, because of sin, he built a wall. So there's God, there's man behind the wall. Now, the last Adam says, no more wall. No more separation between God and man. Break that wall down. There was a reason why the veil was torn from top to bottom. It was to typify that there's no more separation between God and man. It was all done. The cross put to death the enmity God had with man. I'll just read this verse and we'll take a break. Ephesians 2, 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting, putting to death the enmity. That enmity between God and man has been removed. Now, here's something important. We can say, you know, we can have enmity with God. Right? We can say there is no God. God is, you know, always judging. God is always putting, you know, causing me to go through troubles. God is doing this. God has never been there for me. God is, you know, at a young age, my family has gone. And we can have all kinds of excuses that we can give. But here's the thing. We may be in, have enmity with God. But the important thing is God has no enmity with us. I picture this, you know, in school or, or growing up as children. You know, you have this best friend. And you fight with that best friend. Right? And then you, you don't talk to him. Him or her. You don't talk to them. Right? You're upset. So you, you don't talk to them. But maybe the other friend is saying, hey, that's happened, has happened. Forget it. Let's move on. Let's, let's continue to be friends. But the other friend is saying, no, I don't want to talk. And this has happened in, in cases where there are brothers as well, own brothers. One brother wants to reconcile, but the other brother is saying, no, he did this to me 10 years back. I will never forget that. Now, the same way, we can be upset about God and say, God is this, God is that. But that does not change the fact that God has no enmity for us. He's still willing to bring restoration upon our lives. 
So that's a wonderful promise that we can hold on to. We'll take a break. We'll come back at 11 and continue from where we stopped. Yeah, let's take a break.